Let's consider the raised cosine pulse, one of the most important pulse shapes in digital communication systems. The raised cosine pulse is actually defined in the frequency domain, and we'll see how that notion of raised and cosine actually shows up in the definition. Let's consider, to begin with, the so-called minimum Nyquist bandwidth pulse shape, again defining this in the frequency domain. We'll say that it is uniform from zero to some frequency B naught, and then it's zero after that. The signal is symmetric in negative frequency space as well. And also to make certain book bookkeeping requirements work out, we'll give this the value amplitude divided by two beta naught, and that's in uh, watts per hertz. Now, the minimum Nyquist bandwidth is also the same thing as one half of the signal bit, bit rate. And bit rate, which is R sub B, would be the same thing as the reciprocal of the bit interval. Now, in the time domain, this rectangle shape in the frequency domain looks like a sync function in the time domain. The amplitude of this pulse is simply A. Other primary or distinguishing characteristics of this sync is that it has nulls or zero crossings at multiples of our bit interval T sub B. So there is a distance of twice T sub B, three T sub B, and so on. Now this time domain signal has infinite extent. These uh, kind of sinusoidal-like wiggles just keep going on indefinitely. Of course, they, they converge towards zero, but the convergence is rather slow. Now, let's see if we can actually do something about that infinite extent. If we round the corners, so to speak, in the frequency domain, that has the effect of starting to taper off the long tails of the sync function. So the, the rectangle looks like a sync, but if we can round the rectangle, that gives us the effect of actually uh, tapering off that sync function a little bit faster. So the basic shape selected for this, this rounding off in the frequency domain is the cosine function. If we add a function to, or add a constant to that, we say we raise it up uh, so it's not centered about zero any longer. Now this also means that the bandwidth of our pulse is increased a bit, and this difference then be between the minimum Nyquist bandwidth and the transmission bandwidth is referred to as the excess bandwidth. So the actual transmission bandwidth would be the minimum required the B naught plus this so-called excess bandwidth, which is given by the scale factor alpha times B naught, where alpha, the so-called excess bandwidth factor, is a constant between zero and one. Alternatively, we could say that alpha is uh, zero to 100%. So this particular picture that I've sketched is for alpha at 0.4, let's consider some other variations. If alpha is rather small and even zero, of course that gets us back to the original uh, minimum Nyquist bandwidth shape. Alpha equals one, smoothly tapers that out uh, to twice B naught. Now let's consider this pulse in the time domain. Doing the inverse Fourier transform, it turns out that this particular pulse shape is the sync function times this other somewhat uh, elaborate function called the tapering function, and it rolls off, so to speak, the sync function tails. For that reason, alpha is also called the roll-off factor. To better understand the 
time domain pulse, let's consider the three major constituents of that pulse shape. The entire expression for our pulse P of T is right here. It consists of a sinc function. In the numerator, we have a cosine function, which I'm plotting separately. In the denominator, we have something that's uh, essentially minus T squared. We have the ratio of those two plotted in the bottom window. So the leftmost graph shows P of T, and let me just get some values to, to actually see something. N controls the total number of, of bits over which to display this pulse shape, P of T. And its null points or, or zero crossings correspond to that bit interval. Now at the moment I have alpha set to zero, so what I'm looking at here is just a pure sync function. Again, we see that this tail persists for a fairly long number of bit, inter bit intervals. As I adjust my sampling frequency, I can either get a more coarse plot or a, a finer plot. Also pay attention to the reciprocal of our, our bit interval. Multiplied by two gives us the bandwidth or minimum Nyquist bandwidth, P naught. So for fairly short duration pulses, we get a wider bandwidth. Let me just round this down to 0 0.01. Okay. Let's now actually try out some values of alpha, something other than zero. So again, we'd see that this is just our sync function. That would be our numerator term, the cosine. And since alpha is zero, we just have cosine of zero, which is one. Here, this entire term is wiped out due to alpha being zero, and we're just left with one. The ratio of these two is likewise simply one. So we're multiplying one times that basic sync function. And so P of T at the moment is just a pure sync function. Now notice the effect over here. We see that the cosine now is starting to taper things off. And this overall tapering function now has started to flatten out the tails just a little bit. Again, back to pure sync. Here we have some more tapering being added. So as you continue to de or increase alpha, we see that the tapering becomes more and more evident. And so what we have is now kind of a nice smooth pulse in the center of our, of our plot. It's what I was doing here is just setting this up so that the auto scaling is turned off and we can kind of see how those taper functions uh, change as a function of alpha. It might be easier to just look at the smoothed version of our pulse now as well. But as I was saying earlier, what we have is this nice smoothed pulse, but instead of having the persistent tails of the sink, we, we've uh, smoothed those out. Now let's take a look at the zero crossings in a little bit more detail. Now the, my display here is always running, so I have to turn off auto scaling in order for that, that new scaling factor to persist. Let's try zooming in just a little bit more. And we can see some kind of interesting behavior going on with the zero crossings. Now in particular, what I'd like you to do is, is consider the zero crossings of the pure sync function. Again, these correspond to a spacing of T sub B, our bit interval. 
and I'd like to consider what happens with those zero crossings as we increase alpha all the way up to 1. If you look carefully, you'll see that the total number of zero crossings actually doubles at the time that we have alpha equal to 1. All right, so let me go back to alpha is 0. So that's the uh, zero crossings just associated with sync. But if you look carefully here, you see that there's actually twice as many. And that's actually a useful technique for um, setting up the receiver because we get this extra zero crossing that can help us to actually synchronize on these pulse signals. Now also, we don't need quite as many uh, bit intervals for our function since it is tapered off at the sides. But we also see that uh, a consequence of having alpha uh, larger than zero and having all these benefits is that the transmission bandwidth is increased. All right, so here it's fairly low, but the penalty for that is that we've got these longer tails.